Sunday, we invite you to worship with us wherever you are. Come on, just where you are, just begin to lift up your hands and worship our great Savior. Hallelujah, yeah. Water, you turned into wine. Open the eyes of the blind. There's no one like you. To the darkness you shine Out of the ashes we rise There's no one like you None like you If you know it, come on, say Our God is greater Our God is stronger God, you are higher than any other Our God is healer Awesome and power, our God, our God. We serve a great God. Oh, oh, oh. come on. Into, into the darkness you shine. Out of the ashes we rise. There's no one like you. No one like you. Hallelujah. 
In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Spirit, Lord, we come, we gather together to lift up your name, to call on our Savior, to fall on your grace, yeah. Woo! Come on, y'all say it with me. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Spirit, Lord, we come, Lord, we come. We gather together we gather wherever you together. are to lift up his lift name, up name, to call on our Savior, to, call on our Savior. to fall on your grave. Fall on your grave. Hear, that joyful sound. Hear that joyful sound of our offering as your saints, as your saints, bow, saints down. bow down, as your people we sing. Will you're not there. God, we believe and we trust in you on this morning, oh God. And we know that there is no God like you. 
So on today, we lift up our hands and we say that there is no God like you. Come on. If you believe that, come on and lift up your hands. We believe it and we receive it. Hallelujah. Lord, here and now, come make your presence known. Burn like a fire.
Thank you, God. We thank you for joining us for our worship. We ask that you sit back, continue to worship, and take a look at our update. God bless you. Wow, God is so good. We hope you are able to experience his presence right where you are. Thanks again for joining us online today. Hey, whether you're a first time guest or um, a longstanding member, we want to ask you to take just a moment to fill out a digital connection card. You can find that link right here. You can also uh, see it in the comments down below. Take a minute today to fill that out. Let us know you were here and you can put a prayer request on there. We'd love to pray for you this week. We want everyone to know, although we can't meet together right now, you are still able to give, and you can do that in three ways. You can mail your giving to 2227 North Carroll Boulevard. You can also give online at churchonajourney.com. And of course, you can text to give right here by following the directions on the screen. Right now is the most important time for us to connect with others in as many ways that we can. And one way you can do that is through our small groups. We have some groups that are continuing to meet virtually, and you can find out more about all of our small groups at churchonajourney.com forward slash connect. It's so important for us to get together, experience life together, connect with one another, and get discipled. So be a part of our small groups starting this week. You're invited to also be a part of our Wednesdays at home format. This is a great place for you to kick back and hang out with us on Wednesday nights. Our adults will be meeting via Facebook Live, so be looking for that on Wednesday night. And our youth will continue to meet on Zoom, and Pastor Heather will send out those details. Hey, thanks again for joining us today. As always, you can check out everything about our church on our website, churchonajourney.com. And we need you to connect with us on social media. So like our Facebook page and go find us on YouTube and subscribe to our channel. Just search Journey Fellowship Denton and you'll be able to do that. Thanks again for being here today. Now let's get ready to hear a great message from our lead pastor, Scott Metter. Hey, welcome everybody to Journey Fellowship Church. We're so glad that you've decided to join us this morning. I'm glad that you came and uh, uh, decided that even in your living room, that you can be a part of worship here. I hope that you felt the presence of God as we worship the Lord this morning, as you engaged uh, right there uh, in your own homes uh, in time of worship and just lifting up the name of Jesus. It's an awesome thing that we still can come together in, in, even in this format and still worship God together. I just thank the Lord for that opportunity and I'm so glad that you're here with us. I just want to say that we've been praying for you, that you have been on our hearts and on our minds. Shannon and I have uh, really thought about you a lot, those of you who are a part of our church. And even if you're not a part of our church, I pray that God's blessing would just be upon you. I pray that, Lord, that our time together would be a time that, that the Lord has ministered to you today. And uh, as, we get, as we move forward, uh, let me just say that, that uh, even though we live in unprecedented times, God still knows your address. He knows where you are. He knows exactly what's taking place in your life. And He is with you and He is watching over you. So never doubt that fact whatsoever. I want you to know that, that the Lord has not lost control of what's taking place in our world today. He's not lost control of America. God is still on the throne and he's going to see us through this. So you just stay faithful. You just keep honoring him and walking close to him. And he will guide us and he will direct us and protect us. This morning, I just want to share with you just a few moments, um, a scripture first. And then I'm going to just tell you a story. This is an important week, as most of you know. And uh, I want to just share that story. But I want to go to the scripture first in 2 Timothy chapter 2, 1 Timothy chapter 2. Beginning in verse 5, the scripture says this, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all men. I want us to pray together and just ask the Lord's word to just speak clearly to our hearts. And I ask that, that you would just open yourself up just for the next few moments to allow God to speak to you that Jesus would become real to you, that you would see him in a new light. Would you just join with me in prayer? Father, I pray that in the next few moments, you just take, Lord, the word of God, that you would open it up to us, Lord, make it real, Lord. Let, let this be something that, Lord God, is, is, is 
Lord, life-changing, Lord, in this time that we live, Lord Jesus, I pray that, God, that you would speak and have a conversation with folks, Lord, that want to know, Lord, what is going on in our world. Lord, you will explain that, Lord. Let them see Jesus, the one person who is the mediator between God and men. Lord, I pray that you'd take your words this morning and that you would challenge our hearts in Jesus' name. Well, friends, I heard this week the president and the task force mentioned something that took, took me a little bit by, by surprise. Uh, and I was, I was not taken aback, but I knew that, that they meant business. But I heard the president and the, the task force say these words. It says the ne- said, the next two weeks will be pivotal moments for our country. That over the next couple of weeks, that the dynamics of this pandemic that we are experiencing will be pivotal that the peak contraction rate and death rates may spike over the next few weeks. I just want you to know that even though that may be true, I want to take you to the Scriptures this morning, and I want you to tell you the story about a week that was not just the most pivotal in those days, but the week that was the most pivotal week in the history of all mankind. This week is known as the Passover week. That's the week that we are actually a part of and is beginning today. It's a week that tells the story of the final week of Jesus' ministry on the earth and ultimately concludes with Him being crucified on the cross on top of Calvary. The Jewish week actually began on Saturday. But Jesus spent that Saturday as He had done for His entire life, spending time with friends, in a normal fashion, observing the day of rest, having a meal together, and praying over all those who were gathered. So what we're going to do this morning is I'm just going to walk you through that week beginning on the Sunday after that Sabbath. That Sunday began as Jesus prepares to enter Jerusalem. Jesus' plan, as He had spent all of His time ministry, and then He finally this week, this Passion Week that he knew was coming. He plans to enter Jerusalem. He would leave Bethany. He would walk over the little hill that was called the Mount of Olives and he would descend down through what, the, what they call the Kidron Valley and then back up the, the eastern slope of, of, of the, the Temple Mount that went, went toward into the eastern gate that entered in Jerusalem. That was Jesus' plan. That Sunday was his day that he would that he would make his entrance into Jerusalem that final time, that entry that we have come to know as the triumphal entry. Ironically, the first thing that needed to be done during this powerful and gracious, grandiose entry was Jesus said, I need you to go and get me a donkey. And not just any donkey. He said, I want you to get a young donkey, one that has never been ridden. And so he tells his disciples to go into the town of, into the little village of Bethany, and he wants them to take a donkey that had been tied up there. And they ask him, they say, Jesus, when the owner catches us trying to swipe his donkey, what are we supposed to tell him? And Jesus says, This is what I want you to say. Just tell him that the Lord needs it. The Lord needs it. And then he will let you have it. I just wonder if that would apply at my bank. If I walked into the bank and said, hey, I need to borrow a million dollars. And if the bank asked me why, they could, I could just tell them, well, the Lord needs it. I wonder if I would get any money. Anyway, that's exactly what happened. As the disciples went, they got this donkey. They brought it back to Jesus. And Jesus sits upon this donkey that had been had a saddle made out of it of, of coats, and Jesus begins to make the, two, the short mile to two-mile journey across the Kidron Valley up toward the gates of the city. And as Jesus began to, to move along this, this little road, this, this little trail, people began to see Him. Those gathered along the road would throw their coats in front of Him. People would, would notice Him. They would Even some went and cut palm branches and And uh, they cut them off and they waved them like flags of a king that was passing by, entering the city victorious. They 
They begin to worship him. Some even actually started saying, blessed is he is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. It was a big deal. People knew about Jesus. It seemed like it was working out just as the prophet Zechariah had said in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, when he says, Rejoice because your king, this, the king is going to come this, in righteousness and salvation, a gentle and riding upon a donkey, a foal, a colt. This is how your king is going to come. And it seemed to be that that's exactly the way it was happening. Jesus was seeing all these people respond. And the question is, is why were they responding like that? What was it? We see most everybody in that day, had they knew who Jesus was. They had heard about him. They had heard about testimonies of people who had been completely changed. Their lives had been transformed by the power of the Lord. They had heard about the stories of of lame men who suddenly were able to walk again. They had heard stories about a woman whose son had passed away and was given another chance at life. They had heard the stories about a woman who, who was uh, the, the town prostitute and, and had, had no social standing whatsoever and how the gentleness and the mercy of our Lord had given her a new chance at life. They had heard stories like this. They had heard people talk about about who Jesus was, about His healings, about how He had changed people, how He had delivered people. And that's why these people surrounded Him. So you would think that because of the news of Jesus being everywhere, that that there would be this triumphal entry. There would be dignitaries and powerful people and and leaders and, and, and people surrounding Jesus as they saw Him enter into the city for this final time. But the truth is, that was not the case. On this Sunday, Palm Sunday, Jesus wasn't surrounded by any of those important people. There wasn't a band playing. There wasn't, a, there wasn't, there wasn't people celebrating Him. Jesus entered in this triumphal entry, actually very humble. It was a very humble entry. Jesus didn't try to make a big splash Matter of fact, it's exactly what Paul says in Philippians chapter 2. It says that him being the very nature God did not consider it equality with God something to be grasped. But he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in the appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient, even death on the cross. Jesus' approach to Jerusalem was a humble approach. He was very unassuming. He wasn't pretentious. He wasn't showy. He was a man that was going to Jerusalem on a mission. You could say he was God on a mission. That same Sunday, 2,000 plus years ago, Jesus entered the city of Jerusalem for the final time as God on a mission. His approach was humble. You know, I thought about that, about how Jesus' approach into Jerusalem is similar to the, the approach that He makes to our hearts. So many times, Jesus doesn't come to us with bands playing and, and flags waving and, and important people giving their blessing. That's not usually how Jesus approaches us. Most often it's in the humble testimony of a person whose life has been changed. Of someone who has experienced the power of God upon their life. Of someone whose life was, was completely filled and overwhelmed by sin and guilt and shame and had no way out, but yet Jesus came and changed them. And when you ask them what happened, they humbly say, it's by the grace of God. It was just Jesus. It was just His mercy. It was just Him moving upon my life. I wasn't really, I I had no place to go. I had nothing that I could do. It was all Jesus. It all was Him. It was just Jesus. Jesus didn't tout his, His kindness to people. He didn't boast about it. He didn't talk about His goodness. He didn't do good things. 
so that he could be noticed by others. He just loved people. That's who he was. He wasn't looking for a crowd to gather around him, but people's lives had been changed in such a way that they automatically knew, hey, this is someone that we want to thank. This is someone we want to say, hey, we are so happy that you are finally coming. Jesus didn't do good things so that someone could run around with a camera and film him and post that on on social media so that he could get uh, some likes and people would think better of him. Jesus didn't do those things. He, he, he had compassion on people. It wasn't a marketing strategy that he would do so that he could get more followers. Jesus did those things because that's who he was. In humility, he loved us. Jesus approaches us the same way. He approaches us just like that. He comes to us humbly. Making no demands, but only providing grace. It's offering forgiveness to a heart that is willing to repent. So Sunday, the sun sets and Sunday becomes Monday. And the next morning, Jesus, there in the vicinity of Jerusalem, arrives in the temple On his final week, Jesus visits the very place that you would think that he would visit. He goes straight to the house of God. Straight to the temple. Why wouldn't anybody think that Jesus' last week, on that last Monday that he was in Jerusalem, that he would not be in church somewhere? I mean, his parents had lost him one time before. And you know where they found him? They found him in church. And you know what he said? Why were you so upset? Why were you looking for me? You should have known this is exactly where I would be. But that final week, Jesus walks into the house of God and he's shocked. He's surprised. Overwhelmed. He he even becomes, he, he becomes angry because he doesn't see that is about the Father's business. He doesn't see worship taking place. He doesn't see prayer taking place. He doesn't see the things that should be seen in every church. He sees something completely opposite of that. Now, can I just tell you how much that he loves the church? Christ loves the church like the groom loves the bride. Like a man who falls in love with, with a woman, that, that's, that love and even exponentially greater, that's how much Christ loves the church. That's how much Christ loves the people of God. That's how much Jesus loved the house of God and the people in it. To Him, the church is not just this optional community service. Like some people in our world today that, does, that don't believe the church is essential, Jesus thought the church was an essential institution in society. I know that you've heard that recently. And some of our civic leaders have backtracked some. But let me just tell you, friends, when everything starts to go south in the world, the most important place that you can find is the church, the house of God. The house of God is important. Why? Because that's the only place that you're truly going to find answers. The world can't figure out exactly what's going on, how to stop this virus. Let me tell you one way we could stop it. We get on our knees and we pray and we ask God to stand up a barrier against this virus and to surround people with His angels and ask God to break this virus and this spread, this contagion over the lives of people. That's how it could be stopped. We are essential because Jesus sees the church as completely essential. And then he, as he enters, he wants to see this vibrant, sincere, purposeful, breathtaking church. But on that Monday, he sees nothing but a formal gathering of religious people whose hearts are not in worship who are indifferent, selfish, opportunistic. Even extortion is occurring in front of his eyes. He sees everything that he 
hoped that he wouldn't see. The final week Jesus enters, and you think about that, he just come in on the cult, now he goes to church. Let me ask you something. If Jesus were to walk into the modern church today, what would he see? If Jesus were to look at your life, what would he see? Would Jesus find a church that's beautiful on the outside, but yet sick on the inside? Would he find Christians who were living a holy life, who were living a godly, righteous life, even when no one else was looking? Even when whatever they were doing couldn't be found out? Would Jesus find someone, the the people of God who were prayerful? Would he find people praying and seeking the Lord? Would he find people who were faithful? That even when strange times come upon us, that, that we're still faithful to the things of God? Would he find people who are earnest and sincere? Would he find worshipful people who are eager to worship God and who are eager to to celebrate Him and to lift Him up? You know, just two months ago, two months ago, no one, no one would have guessed what we're experiencing right now. No one would have dreamed that a virus could impact our country to such an extent to where the authorities mandated that churches cease to gather. No one could have thought about that. As a matter of fact, it's so un-American to our mind, it doesn't even fit. No one would have considered that to be true. If you were to have told somebody that at the beginning of January, no one would have believed it because it's so radical, it's so nonsensical. But the truth is, here we are. And I'm preaching to an empty building and a, and a camera. No one would have guessed this. No one would have guessed this in our, in our 244-year-old history of, of the United States of America. We have never seen something like this. Never has there been a prohibition upon the church gathering together. Never has that ever taken place. But the church is now living in that time where so many pastors for years and years and years have admonished the people of God to learn how to feed themselves because there may come a time when we cannot gather together the same way that we are. So be strong in the Lord. Be strong in His mighty power. When you've done everything you can do, stand. Keep standing. Feed upon the Word of God. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. You need to keep a faithful uh, diet of of His Word in our life. We need to keep a faithful uh, time of prayer so we can communicate with Him and allow the Holy Spirit to speak to us. No No one would have guessed where we are living, and that's why so many pastors have said, you got to learn to take care of yourself. Be responsible for yourself. I know a lot of people, including myself, my family, we've stocked up on supplies. Now, we haven't hoarded anything. We don't have enough room for that. But we've got food, pl- food supplies. So one thing I can tell you is that I can go a long time uh, with a little bit of beans and rice and some cornbread. And that's exactly what we've got. <laughs> a lot of people have thought about in this pandemic how to feed their stomachs, but how many have thought about how to feed their soul? That's something that we have to consider. Who's to say in the future that the authorities don't mandate that church meetings can only be up to 50 people? Then what? And what if they say, well, maybe just 25? Then what? The very stories we have heard around the world. And I've lived in Russia. I've talked to people who had had their rights to to assemble and and their ability to gather in a church without without the threat of 
of, of imprisonment and jail. I've talked to those folks and they say, it's for real. You have to learn. I said, what do you do? You have to learn to feed yourself. You have to learn to know what God is speaking to you. You have to, to get into the Word. You have to live it. You have to breathe it because that's your strength. That's your source. If I can encourage everyone to do anything today, just listening to, what, to me to, this morning, I want you to know that God wants you to, to get into His Word. Let this time, the, the pace of life has slowed to a screeching stop. You're not hurry. You're not busy. Most of us have more time to, to do nothing than we have to do anything. The pace of life can't be an excuse anymore. Get into the Word of God. Allow Him to speak to your life. It's the anointing of the Holy Spirit that brings freshness to the Word. Even right now, it's awkward for many of you to have church in your living room. I watched my family last week as I watched online. It was a little awkward. It was different. You're, not in a, you're in the posture of your living room in your home. So you're in a nice, comfortable couch or you're sitting at a table and your posture is not toward worship. Can I just encourage you? You have to make some decisions. You have to do something. Don't feel embarrassed to stand in the middle of your living room and lift your hands to God right in front of your kids and begin to worship the Lord. Matter of fact, I think that's what we need. Sometimes you can come to a gathering of people where there's hundreds of people around and you can just vanish. But now, sir, you're called to be the priest of your home. The pastor can't do that. He can't go to your home. But you can be the priest of your home. God is calling you, men, sir, Grandfather, dad, he's calling you to be the priest of your home, to stand up in the middle of your living room and to begin to worship God and to teach your children right there from home how to serve Him, how to listen, how to respond. Respond to the preaching of God's Word. Don't, can I just encourage, set your phones aside. Once you get one playing and it's on TV or however you're watching, set everything else aside. Give God the time. Monday came and went. And then Tuesday, Jesus finds himself in the middle of discussion after discussion of religious leaders. leaders. Controversy erupts as they try to, to pin him down, as they try to trap him. He's verbally attacked at all sides. The last week that Jesus walked this earth, that Tuesday, and even some that Wednesday, we find people coming after him, trying to trick him, trying to challenge him. And at every turn, Jesus destroyed their arguments. He destroyed what they were trying to do just with His words. He turned it on their head. He spoke in parables. He delivered uh, uh, understanding about what the future would hold. The last week that Jesus, that Jesus shared uh, and, and ministered to people, He shared more about what was coming than anything else. That final week of Jesus' life, that Tuesday and Wednesday, can I just tell you, you were on his mind. How do I know that? It's because if you look in Matthew chapter 24, if you look in Mark chapter 15, if you look in Luke chapter uh, 19, you'll find and discover that there's a lot of things that Jesus was speaking about that wasn't pertaining to right that, that day, that Tuesday or Wednesday, but it was talking about years in front. Jesus knows exactly what we're experiencing right now. He knows the course and direction of your life. He knows the course and direction of this nation. He knows the course and direction of the world. He knows what's coming. And let me tell you, my friend, He knows and you should know because He's given you an idea of what you need to be aware of. That Tuesday and Wednesday, He talked about that because He wanted us to be ready. And then Thursday comes. Jesus not only paired prepares for his last week and his last days, but on Thursday, Jesus finally takes his last meal. His disciples prepare this meal for him. In that 
upper room, they recline, they come together. The disciples weren't exactly sure that this was going to be his last meal, but Jesus sits down and he begins to explain things to them that they had, they had heard once or twice or maybe a multiple times before, but now they were really catching it. Jesus shares bread and he shares, he shares the wine with his disciples and they, they begin to discuss and talk over things and it's just amazing to see how Jesus handles his disciples. He, he smiles, fill the room until Jesus begins to talk about what's coming. Jesus promises several things in that conversation. I talked a little bit about that last week, but Jesus promises, first of all, that he's going to be leaving. He tells them, look, guys, I'm going to be, I'm going to be leaving you. All of a sudden, all those, those smiles became faces of surprise or somberness fill the room. Jesus said, don't worry about it, guys. I'm going to show you how to, how to get to where I am. And, and in the meantime, I'm going to promise that the Holy Spirit is going to, to come and He's going to be with you. Jesus promised that the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, He's going to not just be with you, but He's going to be in you. That's what He said. He will be in you. He promised that, that they would produce fruit through Him. He promised that there would be an unbreakable love and a bond that would be formed by those who would love one another as He loved them. Jesus promised that it wasn't always going to be chocolate and roses. That last conversation with His disciples would, was filled with a lot of information. And some of that information had to do with persecution that would come. Challenging times, suffering times, even for the people of God. He made promises also that their grief would turn to joy. That it would be worth it. That it would be worth it. That no matter what they saw, no matter what they experienced in life, that it would be worth it. I love that song. It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Jesus was telling his disciples, look, the next time you see me, it's going to be worth it, fellas. So stay in there. Hang in there. Some of you are experiencing some difficult times. Things that have challenged your faith. And the devil has come and tried to distort the truth in your mind. He's trying to challenge your faith and, and in so doubt, saying things like, God doesn't care about you. If he did, he wouldn't have let this happen to you. God doesn't care about you. Look at what, is, what he's allowed to happen in your life. Look at the tragedies that you've had to walk through. Look at all the pain that you had to walk through. And here we are again. Look at your life. God's let you down. And that's the voice of the enemy speaking lies. Because I just tell you this, that if you will hold on to, to faith, if you will hold on to him, it will be worth it all. God will turn your grief into joy. There is coming a day when he is going to change your frown back into a smile. He does something after he's given a lot of this information to his disciples, something that's so predictable of Jesus. He tells them that he wants to pray. Let's go pray. And in John chapter 15 and 16, you see that Jesus not only prays for himself because he knows what's coming, he prays for his disciples and he also prays for all believers, for everyone. On Sunday, Jesus had walked into Jerusalem. He came into Jerusalem on that, on that donkey. On Monday, he visited the church. On Tuesday, Wednesday, he was challenged by religious leaders, people trying to catch him, verbally abused. Thursday, he spends his last meal with his disciples, explaining things to them and praying. Thursday was a long day. As Jesus left that upper room, he wanted his disciples to go with him to a garden. A garden that was across the Kidron Valley. A garden that was filled with, it's filled with olive trees. It's a grove. The Garden of Gethsemane. And Jesus prays there in earnest. He even asks Peter, James, and John to to go a little bit further.
further away from the crowd, spend some time with Him. As a matter of fact, Jesus prayed that entire night. He prayed until sweat dripped off of His brow like drops of blood. It was a long day. But Friday would be even longer. Before Jesus ends his prayer time, the garden's filled with lit torches. And through his vision of looking past the, the olive trees and the branches, he sees the face of a man that he recognizes. It's the face of Judas. That only a few hours earlier he had dipped bread in a cup with. Only a few hours earlier he had been a part of those blessings and those things that that he had been talking about. Only a few hours earlier this man who was about to kiss him with, with a betrayer's kiss had been a part. There's commotion that takes place because guards follow. This entourage comes with Judas and they come to arrest Jesus. Jesus backs away. He says, look, are you here to arrest me? I've been with you all the time. Why are you bringing swords and spears? Why do you come soldiers? There's a commotion that takes place, but ultimately Jesus goes with this group of people. And they immediately take him to the the leaders, the Jewish leaders who, who had ordered him to be arrested, that Judas had been working with. And he goes first to the house of Annas, a high priest, the former high priest. He ultimately goes to Caiaphas. He goes to Herod's place. He goes through four different trials, even standing before Pilate, the Roman prefect in charge of that area. In the middle of those trials, Jesus is accused of everything that you could be accused of. Finally, they resolve that it's blasphemy. With anything that they could come up with, it was always shot down. No one could find something good, but finally it was the crowd that riled Pilate enough to beg for the crucifixion of Jesus. He was taken, he was beaten with sticks. He was mocked. They took a huge spiral of thorns and they pressed it upon his head. Blood began to drip down over his face as as the soldiers began to spit in his face and blood and spit mixed together began to drip off of his chin and his beard as they mocked him and tossed him around. Pilate didn't want to crucify him, and he said, I'm going to release someone, and they begged for Barabbas, a known criminal, a a, a usurper of of authority, a, 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 a rioter. And they said, give us Barabbas, because you always give us someone on our special day that we can have as a as just a gift to us. Give us Barabbas, but crucify Jesus. And so Pilate yields to the crowd and Jesus is taken and first to be flogged. He's strapped in the courtyard to a Roman post and then a Roman legionnaire pulls out one of the most brutal weapons of torture that has ever been known to mankind. A wooden handle with strips of leather hanging from it that had sharp pottery and pieces of bone, sharp rocks tied into that leather. That Roman soldier bore down with all of his strength upon the back of Jesus. Ripping flesh and blood away as he pulled back for another lash. This humble, 
man who entered just six days earlier, five days earlier, the city of Jerusalem on a donkey is now strapped to a Roman post. They take his brutalized body. They stand him up. They force him underneath the weight of a heavy cross beam. And they begin to march him early Friday morning down the streets of Jerusalem toward a place called Golgotha, a place that was known by the people around that as the place of the skull. It looks like a skull. Jesus in his weakened condition from the beating and the, and, and the lashing that he had taken, the whipping that he had taken, falls under his weight. The pace was so slow. Jesus was having a hard time. He was strong. His strength, he was able to do it. But, but the speed was not what the Romans decided. So they grabbed a man out of the crowd, Simon of Cyrene, threw him underneath this crossbar bar, and they forced him to carry the rest of the way up that hill, up Golgotha, up Calvary, till they got to the top of the hill. And there they threw the beam on the ground and they threw Jesus on top of it. They took six-inch Roman iron spikes and they drove them through his hands and through his feet. They nailed Jesus to a cross. And as they raised him up, at nine o'clock in the morning, the thud hit. Jesus, hanging, suspended between heaven and earth on a cross between two thieves, like a common criminal. For six hours that Friday, what we call Good Friday, what we observe as this coming Friday, between nine in the morning and three in the afternoon, Jesus hung upon the cross, saying few words, but saying some. Finally, at three o'clock in the afternoon, People around the cross heard him say these words. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Jesus breathed his last breath. And his head fell. And his eyes closed. The Romans verified his death by taking a spear and shoving it up through his side, puncturing the sack of fluid surrounding his heart, and blood and water flowed out of his side. Jesus was dead. Can you just see that picture? What a week. We want to talk about the two weeks that are pivotal. Let me tell you, that week right there is the most pivotal week that's ever been lived out on this earth. The week that our Savior gave everything for us. Let me close in asking you this question. What does this pandemic cost you? What have you paid for, for this virus? How have you paid for this virus? Have you, have you paid the price of your senior year? Have you paid the price of losing your job? Have you paid the price of losing that scholarship? Or have you paid the price of having to cancel that vacation? Have you paid the price of, of, of your time? Some may have even paid the price of this virus by their life being taken by it. As a country, we've paid the price and will pay the price in our economy. We've paid the price in our civil liberties and our ability to gather. We've paid the price of our rights. We've paid the price of social life. 
We socially distance. We don't, we're told not to shake hands, not to hug, not to be close. We've paid those prices. Can I just tell you that there is a virus that's in all of us and that the death rate is much greater than that of COVID-19? It's the virus of sin. It will take your life. That's the price of sin. The Bible says the wage or the payment for sin, the price that's, that's paid for sin is death. That's it. Nothing will stop it. You think this virus that we have right now is bad? The doctors are confused. They don't know what to do, how to stop it. There's no medicine for it. There's no vaccine. Well, let me just tell you, my friend, there's nothing that can cure sin. There's nothing man-made. You can't pay for it in any way. You can't, your, your job, your, your career, your, your liberties, your rights, they can't pay for that time, money. Does, it won't buy you freedom because what you need is you need to be saved from that virus that has just flooded your life. The only thing that's going to change that is what Jesus did that week. The most important week that's ever happened on this planet. There's only one germ X that can cleanse a sinful heart. And it's the blood of Jesus. It's the sacrifice of Christ. Let me just ask you right now. Now that God has slowed everything down and He's gotten our attention, my prayer is is that this nation would wake up. That we would repent of our sin. That we would quit trying to live a Christian life that's also shared with the world. It's like a house where Christ is invited to live and so is the world. Friends, listen to me. There is the number one killer today is not the coronavirus. The number one killer is still and has always been death is sin. And today, as you've heard me, I, I pray that you would listen to that voice that's speaking right now. It's the voice of the Holy Spirit that He would speak to your heart. And if there is something in your life that you know that God is not pleased with. Would you just pray and take a moment? As I pray for you, as I pray with you, would you just take a moment and say, Oh God, through the tragedy of this, this virus, let me see the most pivotal thing that's ever happened. It's not going to be the next two weeks of the coronavirus. It's the week that's already taken place, the week that Jesus paid the price for you. I want to pray with you right now. Father, I thank you, Lord, for your word. Lord, I know that the time that we live is, Lord, it's so unique to us. But Lord, through the centuries, there's been moments where you have rang the bell. You have caused and allowed things in, in our life, Lord, to slow us down to a point to where we must take notice. I implore those, Lord, today to take notice of what you're speaking to their hearts. I pray for those, Lord God, who are just playing, Lord. They're playing with church. They're, they're, they're living loose. Lord, their relationship with you, Lord, is... Lord, it's not reflective of you. I pray that, Lord Jesus, that you would touch their life, that you would speak to them, Lord, that you would draw them close to you. Those, God, who have sin in their heart, Lord, I pray that, Lord, they would fall right now on their knees, that they would just find a place to pray. 
that, Lord, that you would forgive them. Father, wake up this nation. Let our fear of sin and the destructive nature that it will have upon that it has upon our life be far greater than our fear of this virus pandemic, Lord, that swept our world. God, let us see the truth. May you, Lord, be glorified in, in our day through this tragedy that no one wishes for, that no one is happy about, not even you, Lord, and through somehow through this, Lord, that you would draw us close to you. Draw us close to you. I praise you today. I pray your blessing upon those who have listened to us, been a part of our service. Watch over them, Lord. Protect them, Lord. And we put our trust in you. Thank you, Lord, for being willing to spend that week so long ago that changed us, changed our lives. Thank you, Jesus, for your work. In your name we